here to tell you all about KDL Summer Wonder Program. It's a fun way to stay reading and learning all summer long. Our 30-day challenge is free and open to all ages. Summer Wonder kicks off on June 1 and runs through August 7. Summer goes fast. Don't miss out on all the fun. And remember, stay curious. Hey, everybody. Don Snoink here. I'm a beekeeper presenter from Thorn Apple Woodlands, our small company. I go to schools and libraries and talk about honeybees and maple syrup also. So grateful that you can be with us today for our honeybee program called the details are in the details because that fits in with the 2021 reading program theme of Tales and Tales. One of those tales is spelled T-A-L-E-S. That could be a story or a legend or a folklore. You'll hear those words, legend and folklore, in our program. So think T-A-L-E-S when you hear those words in the program. The other kind of tale, T-A-I-L. That's what a dog wags, isn't it? Exactly. And a honeybee has a tail, too. It wags its tail sometimes in a waggle dance to communicate with the other bees in the hive. We'll talk about that later in the program. Plus, people are scared to death sometimes of the bee's tail. Why would that be? What's in a bee's tail? The sting. You got it. Now, some people find that uh, the bee venom in a bee's sting is helpful for their arthritis, for aches and pains. I sting myself on purpose quite often uh, because it, for me, like if I got a sore wrist, I might sting that area. I just did that quite recently. I don't know if you can see that red mark or not, but for me, it helps with aches and pains and arthritis kinds of things. So a honeybee sting can be a good thing too. Let's go enjoy the show. Thank you so much for being here. In every hive, there are three types of bees. There is one queen, there are thousands of worker bees, and there are a few hundred drone bees. Now at the peak of the population, in a hive this size, there could be 50 to 60,000 bees in that hive. Let's see if I can show you a picture. There we go. Now the queen is the mother of all the bees in the hive. She's the bee in the center of that picture with an arrow pointing at her. She has a long tapered abdomen. The parts of a bee's body are head, thorax, abdomen. So we have a we have head, then thorax, and then abdomen. Those are the parts of a bee's body. Now the queen you saw in that picture is a long tapered abdomen. It comes to a point at the end. That's where the eggs come out. She's an egg laying machine. She lays two thousand eggs a day so may and june she's laying the most eggs of the season two thousand a day can you imagine the queen's body also produces pheromone that keep the colony working properly if i were to take the queen from fifty thousand bees take her out and you can do that carefully by her wings the bees in there would know she was missing because her pheromone or her smell would be missing from that colony and they would start to make a new queen right away later I'll tell you how they would do that okay the second kind of bee in the hive is the worker bee now in that picture if we can bring it back all the two bees in that picture have an arrow the rest of those bees in that picture are worker bee worker bee worker bee worker bee they're the girl bees, and they do all the work of the hive, girls. <laughs> Does that sound fair to you? Uh, the boys are laughing, but that doesn't sound fair to me either, really. Now, since I'm a boy, I might not mind. You girls doing all the work of the hive. Ladies, moms, you're saying, yeah, just like at home, right? I know, I can hear you. The girls do the gathering jobs, gathering water, nectar, pollen, whatever's needed for that hive. They build wax from their bodies and make it into comb like you see right here, that beautiful hexagon design that we call comb, all done by the worker bees. The worker bees guard the entrance to the hive. Every time a honeybee flies into that hive, it gets touched by the front legs and feelers of a worker bee that's how they smell if they smell like that bee doesn't belong in that hive they'll kick it out and 
if a yellow jacket or something like that tries to fly into that hive, they'll push it out. If it keeps trying to come in, they'll sting it to death. And I'll see a dead bumblebee or yellow jacket in front of that hive. Now the bee that stung it to death dies too, because the honeybee gets one sting. Honeybee stings to defend its home or defend its hive. And only the worker bees can sting, interestingly enough. Now I gotta resurrect these bees, just a minute. Pick them up and put them back here where you guys can see them. That's the worker bees, the girl bees, they do all the work of the hive. The third kind of bee in the hive is the drone bee. They are the boy bees. And boys, the drone's job is to sit around and do nothing and eat honey. This is just like at home, isn't it, ladies? I know, I know. And girls, this is totally unfair, isn't it? Don't worry, girls, you're going to get your revenge in a minute. Let's show the picture of the drone bee. The bee at the bottom in that picture with an arrow pointing to it is a drone bee. You can see it's a little bit stockier shaped, a little wider shaped, and they have big wraparound eyes. You can't see it on that picture. But uh, all the better to see the queen with, because the drone's job outside of the hive is to mate with a queen. The drones gather in an area high above the trees. When an unmated queen flies to that area, 12 to 18 drones will mate with that queen and the drone dies instantly after mating. Its useful life is over and then the queen can fly back to her hive and start laying eggs. Now girls, this is in the fall, this is where you get your revenge because the drone bees get kicked out of the hive to starve to death. Boys, it's not so fun being a drone in September when they get kicked out to freeze to death. So I know girls, I can hear you laughing. That's just the way it is because the bees know they cannot survive their winter if they're gonna allow bees to live in that hive that are gonna do no work and just eat. So they kick them out. Now, <laughs> all right, and the drone has no sting. So if you ever wanna pet a bee, make sure you pet a drone bee because the drone cannot sting you. It has no sting whatsoever. All right, now that queen, when she flies back to her hive, she'll start laying eggs. And on this picture we're showing, you can see there are eggs in there and maybe you cannot see them. The eggs are like a teeny tiny grain of rice standing at the base of the cell. <sighs> now you can see the eggs, can't you? Yes. That is a gorgeous picture. And that's something a lady took from our hive with a special camera that took super close ups. All right, remember that picture. So the, the egg is standing at the base of its cell for three days and eggs an egg and then it hatches or it turns into a larva. And it doesn't pop like a chicken popping out of an egg, but it lies down in the base of the cell in the shape of a letter what? Kids say it. a letter C, yes. So that larva is in the shape of a letter C now for six days. And during those six days, the larva grows big. And we can show you on a picture here where the larva are getting bigger and bigger. Some of the larvae you can see at the bottom of that picture are just little wet spots where the larva are so tiny you can hardly see them. And then you can see the white larva in the shape of a letter C. So for six days, they're a larva, and then the honeybees cap it over with a waxy substance. And you can see that on that picture where some of those larvae are covered over. Now, when those larvae get capped over, they underneath that capping, they are for 12 days. So three days are an egg, six days are a larva, 12 days underneath that capping. And during that time they're under that capping, the larva spins a cocoon and pupates and transforms into a honeybee, much the way a caterpillar transforms into a, say it, butterfly. Yes, exactly. That's what's happening underneath that capping. So 21 days ago, it was laid as an egg, and now a new worker bee is chewing out of that wax capping and emerging from its cell or climbing out of its cell. Now that honeybee doesn't fly from its hive right away, but it lives in that hive for three weeks doing many different jobs in that hive. Its first job might be to clean out its own cell so that the worker bees can put in there maybe honey or um, uh, pollen or the queen can lay another egg in there. It all depends on the season and what the bees wanna do with that cell next. But then they graduate to different jobs. 
uh, in that hive, feeding the larva, becoming a guard bee at the entrance to the hive and things like that. And then they become forager bees where they fly from the hive, gathering nectar, water, pollen, whatever's needed for that hive. You can see a picture here of some larva in the shape of a letter C. And I'll go on. Oh, how do we start a hive of bees? One of the ways that we can start a hive is by buying a package of bees. And you see that on that picture right there. I can show you a package in real life here. I can get my hat off there. Here's what a package would look like without the bees in it. There would be 10 or 12,000 bees in a cage like this. That's three pounds of bees. There's a feeder can with sugar syrup like this. That would have a couple pinprick holes at the bottom for the bees to put their little tongues into to get a drink while they're traveling on a tractor trailer truck from either Florida or Georgia or California. I've been ordering bees from California lately. There'd be a queen in a cage inside that package of bees. You saw in that picture where the bees were all clustered up on the top of that cage. Maybe we can show that again. That picture is showing all the bees clustered at the top of the cage, and it's in that cluster of bees where the queen's cage is. Good. And I would take that package of bees, and here's what I would do. I'd bunk it on the ground, make all those bees fall out of the bottom of the cage. Then I would take out the feeder can and put it into the beehive. I would take the lid off my beehive, and I would be ready to go to put the queen's cage in there. I would leave her in her cage and then pour the bees in. I'll show you a minute how a beehive works. This is the top cover. I put that, put that down. Then there's an inner cover. It has a little hole here for ventilation. The inner cover gives a dead air space for, uh, it keeps them cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter because of that insulating air space. And I'll take that off. Then there are 10 frames in a box. So here's what a frame looks like, like this. There are 10 frames in each of these three boxes. This is a full size hive that I'm working with here. Hard to get the frames in when I'm not looking. There it goes. So we have one, two, three boxes tall here. Honeybee flies into the entrance, climbs up into the frames, does what it has to do in those frames, then climbs back down and goes out the same way that it came into that hive. And that's how a beehive works. This design of beehive was developed in about 1853 or so, and it hasn't changed much since then. I'm gonna cover it up here again. Good. Now on my package of bees, that queen in a cage, I will show you a picture of her. I take her out and put a yellow dot on her thorax. Remember head, thorax, abdomen? So that I can find her better. And then this is the picture of me shaking the bees onto the frames. That's a pile of bees right there, but the bees will work their way in very quickly into the hive. And you can see I started with one box. As the bees need more room, I add the second box. When they need more room again, I add the third box. But in this picture, you can see the feeder cans on the ground and a few bees stay in the packages. So I put those right next to the hive and by evening when it's dark, the bees will go in, will all be into the hive. You can see I put a brick or a block of cement on each hive that keeps the wind from blowing them off or whatever. Also, I put up at the, entrance in the fall i like to put a mouse guard so that uh, no mice can enter the hive and that last picture was of a mouse guard where the bees can enter and exit through the holes in the metal mouse guard but the mice cannot get in in the fall the mice would like to get in there um, they would make a nest in there and go to the bathroom and it's just a problem to have mice in the hive because they eat through the wax and eat honey the bees aren't bothering them because the bees have formed their winter cluster of bees and it's cold, so they're not bothering that mouse. But if a mouse tried to get in one of my hives now in May and June when the bees are flying in and out of the hives, the bees would sting it to death so fast. It'd be amazing. It'd be kind of fun to watch, maybe. I don't know. It's not very nice for the mouse, but it would be interesting. So 
Uh, this picture is showing that in the spring, sometimes we give uh, sugar syrup to the bees. You can see that jar of sugar syrup. Uh, that makes the queen think there's nectar coming into the hives before things are blooming and she'll lay more eggs. Uh, also, we provide water for the bees. This is a chicken waterer with some rocks on it so that the bees can land on those rocks and get a drink. And here's what the bees use water for. Bees use water for two things. One is air conditioning. Air conditioning? Yes, exactly. When the bees take drips and drops of water, put it on the comb in the hive, and then they fan their wings. And what do you think that does? Kids, did you ever run around and get all hot and sweaty on a summer day, go inside the house and stand in front of a fan that's going around and make, make that funny noise? Uh, <laughs> did you ever do that? And what's happening to your forehead while you're doing that funny noise? Is it getting warmer or cooler? Cooler because of evaporation. Same thing in the beehive. When they put drips and drops of water on the comb, fan their wings, make air flow through that hive, it evaporates the water and cools the hive. Also, bees cannot digest honey when it's thick like the honey that we eat. Can you see the bubble going up on that honey? See it going up? Yeah, I can see it going up. So hopefully you can too. This honey is thick like the honey we would eat. Bees can't digest that. Kids, that means that their stomachs can't handle it. So they need to add water to that honey so that they can digest it or their stomachs can handle it. Now, if they, uh, if they added water to that honey and left it watery in the hive, it would ferment or spoil. Adults, fermented honey is called mead. It's the oldest fermented drink known to mankind and it's still being made to this very day, I promise you. Okay, if you wanna know how I know, send me an email and I can tell you how I know. So those are the two ways that honeybees use water in their hive and for themselves. Now, the bees can make a new queen at any time. Any worker bee egg, which is a fertilized egg, could become a queen if they feed it a special diet. When they feed it that diet of royal jelly produced in a gland in the worker bee's heads, the larvae grow big. And you can see on that picture, there are two peanut shell shaped cells. And that's because they fed those larvae a special diet. Now I can show you live here what it looks like when the bees have those peanut shell shaped cells. Can you see those? Every one of those peanut shell shaped cells would become a queen bee. Now the first queen to emerge or climb out of her cell goes around and stings the others to death in their cells. Girls, is that how you really are? That sounds terrible. I'm teasing you girls because the bees don't know the difference between nice and mean. They're not being mean. They're just acting the way nature intended so that there would be just one queen bee in that hive. If two queens come out at the same time, there will be a queen battle. One will sting the other to death. And it doesn't take very long usually. I've seen it happen in my observation hive in the house where it just took a second or two. Anyway, that's how they make a new queen bee. Any fertilized egg, which is a worker bee egg, could become a queen if they feed it that special diet. Also, bees make wax from their bodies. And on this picture, the bee, you can see bees festooning or hanging on each other. That's what they do when they're making wax. On the underside of the bee's body are eight wax glands on their abdomen. Okay, remember, head, thorax, abdomen. Underside of their abdomen are eight wax glands. Honeybee eats honey. That allows those glands to produce wax. The wax comes out of their bodies as a clear liquid. When it hits the oxygen of the air around us, it turns opaque or cloudy like a fish's scale. And then using its mandible, the part of its mouth shaped like this, the honeybee can take that wax flake and put it where it wants it and form it into the beautiful hexagon design that we call comb. And you can see all those gorgeous hexagons, all made by the worker bees and all this wax is made by the bodies of the worker bees. It's really pretty amazing. This frame is showing that while they make the wax, they're actually putting honey in there too. You can see that, oh, this one doesn't have any honey in it, but you can see they're almost filling up the frame and this one has some liquid honey in it. You see some shiny liquid there, that is honey. And they're filling up that frame with wax. It's so cool. Eventually they'll have that whole frame full of wax. 
Hey, I'm thinking of a word that starts with letter, letter P. That picture was one of an orchard with blooming fruit. That was a peach and cherry orchard. Help me think of the word that help. See if you know the word I'm thinking of. You can say it out loud. It starts with the letter P and I hear people saying pollination. Yes. Bees take pollen from flower to flower to flower. That allows that plant or tree to produce seeds and therefore fruit. So people say one third of all the food we eat is a direct result of pollination from a honeybee. That makes me think that honeybees are very valuable to our food supply. Many farms and orchards pay money to a beekeeper to bring their hives onto their property when their crops are blooming. Think of all the things we eat that are thanks to a honeybee pollinating apples, oranges, pears, peaches, cherries, blueberries, cranberries, raspberries. Oh, I'm getting hungry thinking about it. You like to get a pumpkin in October, kids, thanks to a honeybee pollinating that pumpkin vine blossom so it can turn into a pumpkin and you can get it in October. And adults like your morning coffee, thanks to a honeybee pollinating that coffee bush so it can turn that blossom into a bean that you can grind up to make into coffee. So many things are a direct result of pollination from a honeybee. And it's really, it's really an incredible thing what honeybees do through pollination. How many of you have ever seen a swarm of bees? There's a beautiful picture of a swarm. Thank you for raising your hands. And whenever you see a swarm of bees again, call a beekeeper like me because one of the most fun things I do in beekeeping is gathering swarms of bees like you just saw there. Bees swarm by, um, because that's how they expand their population. Did you know honeybees are not native to the United States? The European settlers brought them here in about the 1600s. And the Native American Indians that were here already used to call honeybees the white man's flies because as the honeybees advanced westward by swarming, when the Native American Indians saw honeybees, they said, oh, I'll bet you the European settlers won't be far behind, and they were right. So honeybees, when they swarm, uh, usually it's May and June in Michigan is swarm season. They make a whole bunch of queen cells in a hive when they're ready to swarm, and then half the bees engorge on or fill up on honey. And then they put the old queen that's in there on a diet so that she can fly. And they chase her around, make her skinny enough to be able to fly because a well-fed, well-mated queen cannot fly very far at all. Or maybe six feet is all. So they get her on a diet skinny enough to fly. After they've engorged on honey, half of the bees leave that hive with the old queen. <laughs> It's a tornado of bees and it's amazing to watch. It's pretty loud too. You can hear it from hundreds of feet away. Uh, it's sad to see when the bees are coming from my own hive because that means that year I will probably not get a harvest of honey because they just, half of my bees just left with half of my honey to start a new hive. Now after they swarm, they're gonna cluster into a tree branch, much like the picture that you just saw. And while they're on that, clustered on that tree branch, they're going to send scout bees in all directions trying to find a new place to live. When they find a place, they're going to come back and do a figure eight dance right on that cluster showing the other bees where they think they ought to live next. If we can show that picture again of the swarm on a branch, that branch that holds the bee swarm was often considered a good luck charm. So they would save a branch like that because it was good luck, because it's good luck to capture a swarm of bees. So uh, it's a good thing, and I love capturing a swarm like that. I would hold a box on it. We can show you a picture here where I would take that box on the left, hold it under the swarm of bees, shake that swarm, shake the branch, and that swarm would plop right into that box. I'd close up the box, put it in my vehicle, drive home, and I would dump those bees on a sheet in front of an empty beehive, and they'll walk right in. I got to see the queen walk right in, and it's so cool. I love capturing swarms of bees. Plus, it's free bees. <laughs> Who doesn't like free bees, right? Hey, it works for me. So if I don't get there first, the bees might live in a hollow tree. Like you see here, that tree has a little hole where the in a hollow spot inside the trunk of that tree where the bees are entering and exiting that tree and using it as their home. 
So we have some honeybees on blossoms here now that I'll show you very quickly. This is a honeybee on a peach blossom doing some pollination. This bee right here is on a ornamental pear tree. Hey, can you see the pollen on its back legs? Now you can, can't you see that load of pollen? Honeybees are like flying dust mops. Now their hair, their bodies are covered with little hairs. So when they get into a blossom, that pollen gets all over those hairs on their bodies and the honeybee will do this, <coughs> spit some nectar on its front legs and then groom itself, get all the pollen off those hairs and pack it into their upper thigh like you just saw there in the upper part of their back legs. There's an indentation called a pollen basket and that's how they pack those loads of pollen. That was an incredible load on that picture that you just saw. Look at that. What a load of pollen. Can you imagine a honeybee being able to fly with a load like that? Hey kids, what blossom is this? About the end of May, uh, uh, excuse me, about the end of April, first week of May, we see fields and fields of dandelions. Yes. And that's a sign that the beekeeper season is really getting cranked up because when the dandelions are blooming fields and fields worth, we get very busy. So, and we have a bee on a uh, crocus here. The bees like the crocuses in our yard. Myrtle bees love that. Bumblebees like it too. Uh, yellow rocket. Uh, it's in the wild mustard family. And then about the third week of May will come the uh, yellow sweet clover. When you buy clover honey from the Midwest United States, it's probably from this. The yellow sweet clover, it's cousin the white sweet clover. That I'll show you a picture of here in just a minute. Around the beginning of June in our area in southwest Michigan, we have the um, uh, basswood trees, and maybe you've seen linden trees <clears throat> that the cities like to plant along the city streets sometimes. The linden tree is a, a shorter pyramid shaped tree, but the basswoods that we have in the woods around here are the big tall type of basswood. Makes a real minty tasting honey. All honey tastes different depending on the type of blossom from which the nectar is gathered. So here we have bird's foot trefoil. We have a lot in our, of that in our area. The bees, uh, the honey that that produces is, I think, the best tasting honey in the world. At least I credit that blossom with us having the best tasting honey in the world, and we do. And I'm completely unashamed and biased about that. <laughs> but that's just the way it is. All beekeepers think their honey is the best. Hey kids, what is this blossom here? This is the milkweed. Yes, did you ever find the monarch butterfly caterpillar underneath the leaf, lift the leaves and see, oh yeah, there's a monarch and then take the leaf and the monarch caterpillar and raise monarch butterflies. They bloom, the milkweeds bloom and the blossoms smell so much like honey. They smell really sweet, honeybees like them too. Then we have white Dutch clover. Uh, maybe some of you adults remember back when grandma used to say, don't walk barefoot in the lawn, you might get stung by a bee because of white Dutch clover. They used to add white Dutch clover seed to the uh, grass seed because white Dutch clover infuses nitrogen into the soil. Kids, that means that it adds, oh, like fertilizer to the soil to help it grow and be green. I know that bridge. Who knows that bridge? That starts with the letter M. And if I put my hands together like this, like the map of Michigan, it's right here. What's that bridge that connects my hands? Mackinac Bridge. Even on vacation, I can't quit being a beekeeper. And I saw a bee on, uh, if we can show that picture again, I saw a bee on the blossom there. That white blossom is white sweet clover. And that's a magnet for honeybees. So I said, I'll bet I can find a honeybee even here in Mackinac City. And I did, sure enough. The purple one there, the purple flower is spotted napweed or star thistle from Grand Rapids area, Western Michigan up to the Mackinac Bridge. Most honey is made by the star thistle or spotted napweed. It's an invasive species. Many of the great honey production weeds are invasive species. Then in the fall, we have the goldenrod, and when the bees are making goldenrod honey, or honey from the goldenrod, it smells so good. The hives smell like butterscotch. It's pretty amazing. Then after the goldenrod comes the asters. We have harvested our honey by that time, uh, so the aster honey sticks, stays with the bees, and then everything freezes after that. So uh, then the queen will stop laying eggs, 
when everything freezes and uh, she will, the bees will just, because there's no nectar pollen coming into the hive, it kind of shuts down the activity for that season. But in January, the queen will start laying eggs again because the days start getting longer. She's not gonna lay 2000 eggs a day at that point, but just a small patch of brood. Brood is eggs, larva, and developing bees. And then as the spring progresses through February, March, and into April and May, she'll lay more and more eggs as we get closer and closer to warmer weather. Okay, smoke. I got a picture there, if we can show it, of a smoker. I always use smoke when I go into a beehive. And I, the reason I do that is because smoke confuses and calms the bees. And so I put some straw, um, I put some pine needles, dry, uh, yeah, dry pine needles in the smoker and I light it on fire. And that gives a real, real very cool smoke. The reason uh, that we use smoke is is uh, because then the bees don't sting as much. Also, when I puff smoke at the entrance to the hive, they don't smell the alarm smell. There's an alarm pheromone or alarm smell, kids, that when I open up a beehive, the guard bees give an alarm smell that says, there's a bad guy out there, get him. And I'm the bad guy at that time. Even though I'm there to do good things for them, maybe they think I'm a bad guy. So they're gonna come out and sting me. So. If I puff smoke in there, when the guard bees give the alarm smell, the rest of the bees in that hive are not gonna smell the alarm smell, but they're gonna smell what? Smoke instead, exactly. Plus I wear a bee suit like this, and there's nothing special about the fabric of this bee suit. Bees could sting through it very easily. They don't usually use whiter, lighter colors, uh, because bees don't mind lighter colors. We try not to use dark colors because bees don't like the darker colors that makes them think of predators or whatever. So I would put a veil over my head like this and zip it up so no bees, I would zip both sides so no bees can enter. Honeybees instinctively go for the eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. So I make sure to wear a veil over my face. And I usually just roll up my sleeves or keep my hands uncovered because I get better use of my fingers when I have bare hands, when I'm not wearing thick gloves. But I'm gonna take this off because it's kind of warm in here. I have thick leather gloves to use. If the bees are grumpy that day and stinging me a lot, I'll put on my gloves in a hurry if I have to. So that's what I usually wear. Uh, shorts and a t-shirt covered by a full bee suit is how I usually go out into the hives and I make sure I have plenty of water uh, because it's warm working with honeybees. And interestingly enough, many cultures believe that honeybees came from the heavens. Like the ancient Egyptians used to think honeybees came from the tears of their sun god Ra. Huh. And some cultures thought they came from the tears of Jesus as he hung on the cross, uh, which we celebrated at Easter time. So it's real interesting how people thought that. And they also thought honeybees maybe came from the rotting flesh of an ox or a cow. Can you imagine? Gross. <laughs> I know, but they didn't know that a honeybee starts as an egg and to a larva and then a pupa, pupa and, and then into a honeybee. So it's very interesting how people made up stories or folklore like that. Okay, here's the smoker. It's going nicely, you can see, and, not, and I would put the lid on that. Um, I can show you my smoker here. Here's my smoker. I would take off that lid if I could, <laughs> and I would put in there some dry pine needles, light it on fire, and I would top it off once it's lit. I would top it off with some green grass. That makes a nice, cool, cool smoke. So. That's how I use my smoker. Um, you can see the smoker lit in that picture and you can see a bee suit. Uh, my son is wearing a bee suit in that picture filming something that we did that day. This frame right here, what do you think that looks like? Uh, it's covered with bees. Up close, it might look like this. Um, probably some eggs in there. We can't see that on this picture. In this picture here, we can see there's some capped over larva that are turning into pupa. 
There's some eggs there, some white larva, and on the left side you can see some honey. That's capped over with wax. And some pollen in between the capped brood and the capped wax between the left side and the, and the right side, right in the middle there. You can see some colors, that's pollen. Bees use pollen for their protein. So bees use pollen for their protein. We use eggs, meat, fish, peanut butter for our protein, but bees gather pollen because they feed that to the larva. Uh, and they need that protein. So interesting, that's why they gather pollen and that's how they use it. So on this picture, you can see a honeybee chewing its way out. 21 days ago, it was laid as an egg, now it's chewing its way out. And that's an actual picture that we took in our hives and that's so cool. Look how that bee has chewed, has chewed its way out and now it's climbing out. So in that picture right there, kids, that's the largest bee in the hive. What kind of bee is it? Starts with a Q, queen bee, yes. Now, if we can come back to me again, when I found that queen bee, you know what I did to her? I pinched her head and killed her. You know why? Ooh, I sound like a bad guy, don't I? But I like honeybees. Well, her honeybees that she produced stung the daylights out of me. I had to wear gloves, full suit, all the time, anytime. And I don't want bees that are going to be super grumpy. That's not safe if people walk near my hives. I don't want them to get stung. So I make sure that I have happy bees. And I bought a new queen in a cage. I was ready to put that queen in a cage into that hive, but first I had to get rid of the old queen. And then I put the new queen in a cage into that hive. I didn't take her out of that cage and drop, her, drop the new queen into that hive right away because they would have smelled that she didn't belong in that hive. She doesn't smell like our queen, so they would have killed her. And that would have been a $30 bug that they killed and tossed out of that hive. Well, I got easier ways to lose $30, thank you very much. So I kept her in that queen cage and I walked away for about four or five days and then I came back to that hive and then by that time the bees had gotten used to her smell so I could remove her from that queen cage. And then I watched how they acted towards her and they were feeding her, they had accepted her. So I was safe, I could close up that hive and walk away. By the time the new queen's bees uh, started to emerge from their cells, that hive temperament had changed big time. If mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy we say about the home, right? It's true in the beehive too. So it, it's very important for me to have uh, happy, healthy bees in that respect. So. This picture right here that we're showing you is a frame of honey. Now, if we can get back to me again, I'll show you a frame of honey in real life. Here's a frame of honey. I put that cardboard on there so that it stands up on a table. Uh, but this is honey that the bees gathered and once it's ripe or thick like the honey we eat, they cap it over with wax from their bodies. Now bees make honey by finding the sweetest nectar within two miles from their hive. And I say two miles because that's about how far bees fly from their hive. So they're covering a huge area, two miles in any direction from their hive. Have you ever walked or biked two miles? Think about a little bug flying two miles and back. Bees gather nectar, which is a little bit of sweet liquid found inside of a flower blossom. And they gather it by going to that blossom and then Using their proboscis, the part of their mouth that's like a straw, they suck the nectar, a little bit of sweet liquid out of that blossom and into their honey stomach. Bees have two stomachs, a honey stomach and a food stomach in a one-way valve between the two stomachs. So they fill up their honey stomach with nectar, open up that one-way valve, let some of that nectar go into their food stomach. That gives them energy, energy to fly back to the hive. When they get back to the hive, they connect proboscis with a receiver bee. One of the bees living its three weeks in the hive. And then they do this, transfer the nectar from the forager bee, the bee that gathered the nectar, to the receiver bee. One living in the hive, living its three weeks in the hive, and that receiver bee places the nectar into cells. Now it's not nectar anymore, it's honey because of the chemicals added by the bees' bodies and the transfer and whatnot. It's honey, but it's 80% water. So the bees in the hive need to evaporate the water from that honey so that it's 16% water. And they do that by fanning their wings, making air flow through that hive. So when they're drying down honey, the hives smell really good in the summertime. When it's 16% water, then they cap it over with wax from their bodies. 
and it looks like what you just saw. I forgot to do the bee dance. Are you guys ready? This reminded me. That picture reminded me. After gathering the nectar, here's what the honeybee that gathered the forager bee does. It does a special dance in that hive. It does a figure eight dance with a strong waggle of the abdomen in the middle of the figure eight. When the bee, that's telling the other bees where it found the nectar. When the bee's head is upward on the comb, when it does a that means toward the sun. Head down, away from the sun. Head to the right, right of the sun. Head left, left of the sun. So pretend with me that the sun is up there. We'll drop that to the horizon. That would be toward the sun, away from the sun, left of the sun, right of the sun. Remember, because the sun was right there. The length of time the bee does the vibrating tells the distance to that nectar source. Plus, the dancing bee gives a taste of nectar to the bees around it, sensing the dance. So they get a smell for that nectar source. So a honeybee comes from a pitch dark hive into the bright sunshine and flies right to that nectar source. Totally amazing, the communication happening inside that hive. And here are some people he used to think that honey bees themselves came from the heavens. And so they were the ones to bring the honey to the people, which is it's kind of weird and amazing, but that's why honey was so valued. In fact, some cultures, they used honey to pay their taxes. So instead of paying money, they would use honey or beeswax. Beeswax, too, is considered to be extra special because it came from the honeybee, which came from the heavens. So beeswax, candles, and things like that were used in churches for thousands of years. Uh, beeswax was used as payment, too, for many, many things. So pretty incredible. These are pictures of some of our hives. In the summertime, we had boxes for the honey. So the bottom three boxes would be the, where the queen lays her eggs. And then during the night, the bees move the honey up over their heads into the upper boxes that you see there. So that was a good year that year, it looks like, with several boxes tall uh, for honey. Now when we get those frames that are filled with honey, we take them into a room where no bees can enter, maybe my garage, and I'll cut off the wax capping on each side. You can see that that wax falls into a tub. The honey drains out of that, uh, and the wax stays in the tub. Then I would take that wax and I can melt it, um, uh, filter it, and clean it. And then we can pour it into wax molds. We can make things like lip balm and lip balm and skin care, things like that. We add oils to it um, to make these products that we enjoy. Here's a brick, totally pure beeswax. And Oh yeah, that smells really good. Beeswax is an amazing, amazing, amazing product too. And it's been used for thousands of years, for thousands of ways, in thousands of ways. So after I cut off the wax capping, we put the frame into an extractor that spins the honey out. Now there's the honey in the extractor. Oh, that smells good. I can almost smell it in my imagination. It smells so good and that spins the honey out and it comes out of the bottom of the extractor out of a honey gate. You can see that we're straining the honey. We don't filter our honey. We just strain out the wax bits. So the honey you see there in that bear is exactly like the honey that you see here in this frame. We add nothing to it. We take nothing away from it. It's just the way the bees made it. It's so amazing. Honey's an amazing, amazing product. And it can be used for healing. You can put it on your skin, on wounds, or we use it on burns many times. Uh, it helps to take away the burn. It's good for healing. So many things. This picture right here shows you honey that we've harvested. We can sell it, give it as gifts, use it in many ways. Also, that picture is... Um, bees that are gathering thick sugar syrup because we need to have 60 to 80 pounds of honey on the hive in the fall when we go into winter. That means this top box has to be full of honey. The second box has to be half filled with honey. That would be about 60 to 80 pounds. If we don't have enough honey, then we would give them a thick sugar syrup. 
that they could take back into their into their hive for for their food. In the winter time, do bees hibernate? No. Uh, the bees in that picture right there have formed a winter cluster. The queen is in the center of that. They have honey up over their heads. Uh, the queen has just started laying eggs. Maybe it's January, February, she's laying some eggs. The bees will keep it 95 degrees in that center or that of that cluster of ball of bees. Picture a soccer ball of bees in that hive, the queen in the middle of that. And they keep it 95 degrees by shivering their thoracic muscle. That's the muscle they use to flap their wings, but they disconnect from their wings. They don't flap their wings, but they shiver that thoracic muscle that generates heat. They conduct that heat into their heads, climb into a cell head first, and they can keep it very warm that way, 95 degrees. That ball of bees around them is like a huge blanket keeping that heat in. So, and they eat honey to have the energy to shiver that muscle. So right here is our last picture. And that means that I would love to take you now to see our observation hive. And if we think of things that you might have asked us questions, we can talk some more out there. I'd love to show you some live bees in an observation hive. Thank you again for, for watching us. Uh, it's been so exciting to do this over a video format instead of live, even though I'd prefer to be face to face with you. So let's go check out the live bees in the observation hive. Today we're going to show you the observation hive in our house. And we said, why not? It's a beautiful day. We'll go out to the real beehives and show you a beehive. So the smoker is lit, ready to go. I'm going to puff the entrance. This lid was on the hive. I picked it up, puffed a little bit of smoke in there. Now I'm gonna open the hive and get out a frame to show you. What will we see? I'm starting with a frame on the edge of the hive. Beautiful. It's a beautiful frame of, over here we have capped brood. Those are developing bees that are all capped over. If I blow on there, the bees move a little. Now you can see that some of the holes are empty. Some have larva in them right here. See the color there, that's pollen. And the liquid on top is honey. Now I'm watching for the queen bee as I do this. Again, on this side, beautiful capped brood right here. I set that frame aside and I'll put it in later. This is a, this is a smaller hive, a nucleus colony of bees. I started it as a package of bees. Actually, a whole month ago. This is beautiful. Beautiful cat brood all the way. Hardly any mist cells. The bees are very calm on the comb. They're not running around crazy. I'm watching for the queen. Frames are kind of stuck together by bee glue or propolis. Now this frame, this was all solid cat brood. Now there are open cells right here. That's because that brood or those bees emerged or came out of their cells. And then the queen laid eggs there. I see eggs there. So even if I don't find the queen, I know that she's in here because I see eggs. I get the sun shining over my shoulder uh, that way that sun shines right into those cells. All the cells are built at a downward angle. Uh, do you see that bee right there? That one right there is a drone bee. The ones around it, worker bee. But this one right here, that's a drone bee. The other one that just flew away was a worker bee. This one is a drone, no sting. 
There's a bee right there with pollen on its legs. Can you see that? A little bit of pollen on the legs there. Remember, we're watching for the queen. I'll show you that side while I look at this side. See if you see the queen. Oh, there's some beautiful orange pollen right there. Pollen's all different colors depending on the type of blossom from which it came. Beautiful orange pollen, gorgeous. This queen is doing a great job. There's fresh new wax here. That's all white wax. It's gorgeous, new wax. I'm not seeing the queen yet, but we'll find her. Maybe we'll find her. This queen doesn't have a mark on her yet, so. All right, again, we have beautiful new wax, good looking capped brood here. Worker brood. The, the drone brood is bumpy shaped, and that's in a wider cell. One more time for the queen on this one before I put it back. Sometimes I miss her. She's probably in the top box. There's a little bit of comb right there that's kind of just in the wrong place, so I'll get it out of there. You can save those pieces and melt them later. I'll push them all together. And I put the lid down first is because we're looking for the queen. For you guys to see her, uh oh, you might have missed her because there's only one frame with comb in this box. It's been such a cold spring this April that the bees haven't been able to make much wax. They need it to be warm to make wax. It's been so cold that they haven't been able to develop as fast as they normally would. So, if that queen's not on this frame, and I doubt if she... Oh! <laughs> Look at there. See her? Right there she is. A beautiful, dark, carniolan queen. Look at her. She's gorgeous. She's. I love to see a nice, big queen like that. You see? My hive tool's touching her there. Oh, she's awesome. Look at that. Okay, shall we mark her? I hope you guys are seeing her. I hope I'm holding this in the right spot for you to see, because that is beautiful. There she is walking on the wood now. And back down onto the comb. I'm gonna mark her while you're watching. I have to go get my marking pen. All right. My storage sock here. I have a marking pin. There it is. It just fell to the ground. And this tube right here. And the plunger. I'm going to tickle her into this tube, plunge her gently to the top, mark her with this pin. Here we go. I got to find her again. Okay, you guys can help me find her. If you see her, let me know. I don't see her. Oh, yep, there she is. Right in the middle of the frame, see her? I'm gonna, with one hand, tickle her right into this tube without hurting her. There, she went in. We've got her safely in here. I'm gonna shake her onto the plunger. Plunger to the top and get her thorax right in one of those squares. Oh, I gotta move her a little bit. Or she's gotta move just a little tiny bit. Move a little. She keeps going in the wrong spot. Come on. Come on, Queenie, get right in those squares. Right in one of those squares with their thorax. Yeah, right there. 
get my pen, test it on my thumb. Come on, just a little bit of a move. Good. All right there. Now we'll let that dry just a little bit. I don't know if you can see her in there walking around with a mark on or not. We're kind of letting the paint dry. I'm going to leave her in here for a second while I put this hive together again. Take one of these and put it in the top box. One of these with nothing and put it in the bottom box. Push them together. These are getting a little more insistent that I get out of here. They've had enough of me. I remembered. I remembered our queen. Here she goes. Can you see her there? The dot. I'm going to put her right in now. I like to watch her go in. There she goes. You're on the comb. Whoops. There she is with her green dot. She's a marked queen now. We know how old she is. And because I'll write it in my book. And we can find her better with that green dot. Thanks for watching. Have a great, great summer. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And I'm so thankful that we could do this by video. This is something we never could have done in a live show. So, see ya.